thanks for uh, uh, the invitation to discuss these uh, uh, these papers. I the task I I received uh, was to uh, put these. Uh, papers, these contributions, into the wider uh, context of uh, are you sure this is open? Uh, the wider context of uh, um, of the literature, the economic literature that uh, has been developed over the years in on this area. And uh, uh, so I, this is what I'm trying. I will try to do. Uh, on the ad academic debate on, on the resource course. So the, the debate started in, in the 70s uh, the, 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 with the notion of uh, the Dutch disease, as we all know. The Dutch disease is a purely macroeconomic uh, effect of uh, basically uh, appreciation of the exchange rate that makes uh, industrial production uh, expensive and uh, uh, therefore uh, leads to industrialization of the country that uh, found, the, found these resources in uh, uh, natural resources abruptly. The Dutch case is, in fact, the, 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 case, this, the exemplary in this case. And uh, I would say that uh, the literature in the 70s, in the 80s, and also in the early 90s was uh, basically in, uh, in agreed basically with these uh, uh, interpretations. So a negative effect across the board of, uh, uh, of natural resources on the competitiveness in general of the country. The competitiveness may be uh, defined in many ways, of course. The change in this literature uh, started in uh, uh, in the 90s, in the late 90s. In the late 90s, uh, two things happened. Uh, from the theoretical point of view, from a theoretical point of view, uh, we have that uh, we started using uh, uh, theoretical models that were developed before, that were developed in the 80s actually, on imperfect information to this sort of problems to governance issues, to politicians' selection, to uh, democracy, to autocracy, to what was called uh, political economy. Some people try to call it political economics, but <laughs> the word did, didn't went through. So we use political economy, which reminds us of 300 years later, some earlier, some, something else. But OK, it's political economy. We call it political economy. And so this was one big change. So the introduction of uh, uh, hidden action, uh, inf information, all these things that started in the 80s, basically. The, the build-up was in the 80s uh, and exploded in the 90s. Um, so this was from the theoretical point of view. And uh, the availability of data. So we had in institutions, uh, important uh, institutions that started uh, collecting and uh, uh, Public, made, made public, made public uh, data on governance. So we had this idea of governance and uh, data. The beginning was a very, 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 very short uh, time span, which made life very difficult to those who were trying to do something at the beginning. But in the end, this accumulated over time. And now we have some uh, sizable uh, data uh, in, on, over time and over countries that allow us to make uh, interesting, hopefully, and useful, hopefully, uh, analysis. And uh, uh, in this sense, I, when I teach these things to uh, my PhD students uh, in, in Verona, I, I, I use this sentence that, that I, I will tell you. I say that, basically, the public choice school was doing the same things 20, 30 years earlier, 30 years earlier. But from a different point of view, in the public choice school, so the public choice school was using, was applying uh, uh, maximization, utility maximization uh, to politicians, to bureaucrats, to non-market issues, uh, under the idea that all politicians were bad, 
And so what, the, uh, what was the, the purpose of this literature was to try to find, uh, uh, to design institutions, constitutional institutions, so writing the constitutions, the limits to the politicians in order to reduce the harm that they could do. So this, is, this was the problem 30 years late, earlier from public choice. The problem with political economy, as I see it, as I like to see it, is that, no, it's, uh, politicians may be good or bad. There is not a single type of politician or bureaucrats or whatever. And uh, the issue is to select the good politicians. Because if we are able, if we were able to select the good politicians, we may have, as a result, good outcomes in terms of uh, GDP or per capita, in terms of uh, social uh, uh, metrics, in ter many terms that, for example, uh, Antonio has shown in, uh, in, uh, in the few slides he, he, he showed at the beginning. So I, I think this happened, this change happened in the late 90s, uh, early, early 2000. And uh, if I can uh, uh, summarize where the literature has uh, arrived now, this literature that we have, yes, that we have seen until now, is uh, uh, oh my God, uh, is heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is the, the word that uh, because we have, uh, as we have seen, different constraints on the executive, different uh, the different nature of natural resources as. Tanya has uh, shown point resources uh, uh, versus diffuse resources. We have different initial conditions uh, that may lead to different uh, uh, outcomes. So the um, heterogeneity of uh, the, the, the starting points and of all the countries and all the stories that we can tell, uh, it's very important. This reduces the generalization that we can do in the literature, in the uh, academic literature, but improves the ability, our ability to, uh, our, the realism of what we can say, what we can analyze, and how we can categorize different things in different uh, views. Just one minute to say what is missing. I think that what is missing now in the literature, it's uh, one thing that started very early in the state capacity literature, so the, the, the analysis of legal capacity. Legal capacity, fiscal capacity has boomed. We are part of this boom. Um, legal capacity has been uh, forgot. Uh, probably is less tractable than uh, uh, fiscal capacity. It's more nuanced. There are some difficulties inherent to the data, to the definitions, and so forth, but I think it would be important. It would be important because it's important, it would be relevant, very relevant for efficiency. In the, uh, which this was named in the, in the plenary session. So the efficiency of the ro rows, registration of land, of uh, many things, uh, may be extremely important for, uh, um, for this. A uh, last thing is that now we have, we have new resources and new countries that are entering into this market because the net transition, uh, net zero transition is opening up opportunities for countries that, some countries that never exported uh, natural resources now found themselves with natural resources or other opportunities came out. And so this would be a good thing for us as academics because it will create a lot of opportunities for analysis, but we should try in terms of policy to avoid the mistakes that we did before, that has been done before. We have accumulated uh, analysis and evidence that uh, goes into this direction, and so we should hope to try to, to, to avoid this. One case would be Argentina. Argentina is not, technically speaking, a developing country. 100 years ago, Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world. This because institutions matter, after all. Uh, Argentina has a history of volatility, of bad policies, and so on and so forth. 
these resources, this resource boom that may affect Argentina may be extremely negative for the country if things continue in the way they have been doing. Sorry for, the, uh, for being too. Thank you, Roberto. That was very valuable um, and uh, especially appreciated the, the point on Argentina. If you find uh, lithium and if you have copper like Zambia, you can be guaranteed to be a player in the, in the market of uh, international commodities and uh, develop an extractive sector. So more research for us and more policy insights, hopefully, for a for uh, uh, other audiences, the audience of policymakers. Um, without any further ado, let's move to Olaf. Olaf Lundstol. Thank you so much. Um, happy to be here. A uh, topic that is very close to my heart. Uh, and also happy to, to hear the Zambia presentation, having lived five years and worked on this issue in, in Zambia as well. Uh, I I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think a lot of points were mentioned earlier on in the introduction as well as in the presentation and the excellent um, first discussion. Just maybe three or four major points from my side. I mean, the first one is, uh, what do we mean by resource rents? It's, it's perhaps a tedious question, but it's, it's actually a necessary one because there is a large literature trying to figure this out. There are different schools of thoughts in terms of what it means. There is the more classical uh, hoteling uh, type of rent. There is Ricardian rent. There is, one could say, Schumpeterian rent. So at least three or four different streams of thoughts and theories and approaches to try to say something about what 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 is it actually. And, and then the second one, of course, is how to try to measure it, which is equally very difficult and there is a large literature on this going back to classics in the 60s, 70s and 80s including Stiglitz and uh, a lot of other Nobel Prize winners in economics that have tried to figure this out. Not to talk about trying to measure it because this is also, although we have global measures on this now, uh, to what extent are they precise? What do they incorporate? I think there's a lot of disagreement actually on this. So this, that actually is somewhat important because it also spills into the discussion of tax uh, versus non-tax, what is resource related and not resource related. Um, some of you might have read uh, Professor Robert Conrad, for example, at Duke. He is quite strong on saying that a lot of the discussion on rents and the resource curse is linked to a misunderstanding conceptually in terms of that a lot of what is counted in the rent is actually factor payment. Uh, which is, in, in his mind, very different uh, from what one would normally associate with the, the, with the definition and measurement of rent. So this is just, just to say that there is some complications there uh, on the methodology on, on how to measure it, also with the World Bank and others that I see you use their data. There is a large literature of disagreement on this, where one finds sometimes that the rent is there, sometimes it disappears if you, if you estimate in different ways. So that is just one. This, the second one is a point in terms of development over time and what stage of development different countries find themselves in. And I think here some of you allude to this in the first presentation. It seemed to be a bundle of, of more different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this, this, this is an important point because obviously this is linked to the quality of the institutions one would expect and the political and other type of institutions, these go hand in hand. One doesn't know exactly how the causality is, but there is clear correlation here, of course, over time. And this, this, this would, of course, affect then also naturally in a sort of direct way linked to the possibilities to collect both resource tax related and, and non-resource tax. So to try to distinguish here, which I think some of the presentations try to do is actually quite interesting and, and, and needed, I think. So you, I think there is a necessity to distinguish between low income, low middle income, other, other middle income and higher. Because you, you will find a lot of associations with the different type of, uh, of, uh, of countries. And, uh, and, and through that you will also perhaps find in different time periods that this also can vary. So it would be interesting to see if this changes when one compares different periods over time uh, 
to see if there's any change there that is significant. Uh, maybe not so easy to measure, but there are some exciting, I see some of you use some data sets that are quite exciting and quite new and has a longer time coverage, which is very good. Uh, and then a third point is the difference that I think many of you made and that, or the dis distinction between different type of natural resources. Uh, this I think is a very critical point because there is a huge distinction obviously recognized in the literature especially between non-renewable and renewable but also between non-renewable there are, are very firm differences and I've written a little bit about this especially when it comes to the difference between oil and gas and mining and IMF has written about this in large reports as well but not utilizing fully perhaps uh, ex post data a lot of it is model based a lot of it is ex ante uh, so there is a large potential there, I think, to try to distinguish more clearly. But what I, I have found in the IMF, I think, overall is, is that on average, the, the mining sector, and it was mentioned in the introduction speech today also, there is, there, there, there is really a problem in terms of appropriating the rent and the revenue for the government in the countries in question. On average, it is below, it's half of the ability to appropriate the rent and revenue in oil and gas. This obviously is, is linked then to the wealth issue and to the overall, uh, whether there is any, any revenue stream that could cause this curse or not. Because I think there are, there are large differences between mining rich countries and oil and gas rich countries. And I'm, I'm happy to see that that came out clearly in the presentations as a finding. And I think there are lots of complicating factors linked to that. Uh, similarly, of, also, of course, if one talks about renewables, and there there is a lack of literature, I would say, trying to focus on, on uh, renewables and what happens there. Uh, actually, revenue management in renewable sectors is very poor. So this is another one. This may be not directly linked to the resource curse discussion, but being able in agriculture, in forestry, in fishery, there is some large recent literature on fishery, just, just explaining the money at stake might be much smaller, but it's actually quite important in many ways because it's, it's, it's very much closely linked to the larger economy in many developing countries. So, so I just wanted to make that point. I think that also is, I was very happy to, to see the attempt to try to break down for different type of resources. And I think that that distinction is, uh, is, is very important to make. Now, a final point, uh, maybe I've used my time, but uh, is, of course, I was very happy to see the Zambia presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, I lived and worked five years during, during uh, from 2005 to 2010 in Zambia, very actively engaged with government on this attempt to renegotiate the mining contracts. And I think the outcome of that was, was positive because it did improve the, the revenue potential significantly. After privatization, this was down to close to zero, 0.5%. 0 it went up dramatically. So I think there are a lot of complicated factors between why it went wrong later, and a lot of it is politics. Uh, and the uh, ex-president and others that have, have. But I think uh, what the Sambi experiences did show is that it's possible, uh, I think with strong political support from the top, uh, also, at that point, actually, a strong impartiality enhancing institutions as the Auditor General. Norway and Dutch worked closely with that institution. That improved public expenditure dramatically in Zambia during uh, an important period. So I think that sort of boosted up in the ability of Zambia and, and the political institutions and the government overall to, to, to push for some of the right uh, reforms. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your comments, Oliver. Yeah, that was uh, that was opening up new research areas. Thanks for the suggestions, and thanks also for asking tough questions. What are rents? It reminds us that we should go back to the drawing board uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was a, you know some, something refreshing to hear. You're absolutely right. These questions must be asked. Okay, that takes us to the Q and A. I suggest we first of all check online. What's happening online? Are there any immediate reactions to the discussion here in the in the room? There is one question. 
He's asking, uh, given that developing countries have large number of informal business, how can we capture the informal sector in the tax base and mobilize more revenue from the sector? That's the only question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would ask the panelists to, uh, to try and address this one. Um, Perhaps this is a, a question, a general one, not just uh, for uh, resource-rich uh, economies. But I was thinking, Andre, would you like to react based on your uh, experience, uh, country experience in Zambia? Yeah, thank you, Roberto. I, 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 Roberto is right. I mean, uh, Antonio is right. And that this question was perhaps better suited for Dr. Mossi you know, in, the, in, the, in the discussion. But uh, yeah, the informal sector. Uh, it's difficult to to mobilize. Uh, first of all, because of the absence of uh, uh, property rights, the, the absence of uh, titles. Uh, for example, in, in Zambia, a, a lot of um, property that people do their uh, own or where they run their businesses are not uh, clearly titled. So there's need for capacity in that. The government has been trying to to digitize all this over time, and they're making some headways you know, in terms of um, uh, valuing the properties. Well, they, those, those properties, once they're valued, it's much easier to tax them and you know, also generate uh, revenue. So I think there's a lot of um, work in that direction if we are to bring the, the informal sector and other and, and cover sectors into the into the into the frame under which they can make a contribution to taxes. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, we still have a few minutes. Questions from uh, the room now, please. Hi, thank you. My name is Anna D'Souza. I'm a professor at Baruch College at the City University of New York. Um, so I guess my question has to do um, with corruption. And um, it, I mean, of course, the other side of institutions, right? Uh, for institutions in many senses. So I guess two main questions. One is kind of how we think about your results with the executive constraints and then your broader results, including a lot of different, uh, you know, possible institutions. And, you know, one just, I mean, this may not be the time, some of this is rhetorical, but just thinking of how to kind of balance the, the two, if you had looked at, I was kind of curious as to what other, you know, institutions you looked at, what other sort of measures. And then, of course, in all this work in institutions, the question is how we implement the changes. And so that brings me to this idea of corruption. And you know, you mentioned just now, or someone mentioned, oh, the Zambia, the the potential potential revenue. I think, by the way, I'm not in the tax area, so this, so my language just, you know. Um, so you mentioned kind of an increase in potential revenue, and I was kind of interested in like potential tax revenue versus realized tax revenue. You know, and again, you know, during the the keynote speaker's presentation in the morning, there was a question about. Uh, not exactly constraints on the government, but where how we can hold the government accountable, right? And I guess that that's where my question is, right? In terms of implementing and also what um, what has been done to to look at accountability in terms of the the government side. Uh, and if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, but that's another tough question. Shall we? Essentially, you are asking. We are saying that institutions matter if we want to avoid a fiscal resource curse. How do you go about it? How do you change institutions? Uh, I'll take a second question and then we'll answer both of them. I think the gentleman there, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great presentations from everyone. Uh, my question is actually quite linked um, to the first question, which also speaks about institutions. I think one of the things that came out strongly was uh, the need for institutions, but also constraints on executive power, right? So that's something that, that came out quite strongly. I'm from Zambia, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so, so my thinking was, or my question was around, how do we come up with sustainable solutions? So how do we implement this? Because uh, for Zambia, like many of at least the African countries or sub-Saharan countries, uh, the, the constraints to the executive, or maybe let me put it this way, the executive also holds 
most of the power to actually make those changes. So how do you go about making or, or improving those institutions? So the power to make reforms doesn't necessarily sit with the individual citizens, right? So the executive is still over, over responsible for that. So how do we go about implementing change? So a bit related to the first question, yeah. Thank you, clearly related. Uh, a quick one, yes, please. Thanks, my name is uh, Peter Shevland from NORAD. And um, related to the last uh, points uh, and questions, uh, it might be interesting to look at some work from uh, VDEM, uh, Varieties of Democracy. They uh, looked into sequencing of accountability. So uh, what you're talking about, we want to see uh, strong uh, ex executive constraints, but uh, they have some uh, in really interesting working papers from 2017, I think. And they look at uh, all countries of 100 years, and uh, they see that uh, you've never seen strong horizontal accountability, uh, like uh, parliamentary and uh, judicial oversight without improvement in uh, uh, vertical uh, accountability, which is elections and political parties, and, and also diagonal uh, accountability, which is related to media and social, uh, no, civil society. So, um, so if you want to improve the effective uh, horizontal uh, accountability, uh, the implication of this research, at least, uh, says that you need to work on uh, the vertical uh, accountability, elections and political parties and, uh, and, uh, and the diagonal accountability. So, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. This looks like uh, you're already answering in part <laughs> the first two questions. <laughs> and uh, I'm only chairing, but uh, I hope you don't mind if I say I agree with you. It's uh, <laughs> good work from VDEM and uh, the idea there that uh, accountability in this sense matters. but. Uh, I want the panelists to react to to these questions. Who would like to go first, knowing that uh, we have uh, effectively run out of time? Can you, in one minute each, react? Yeah, one minute. Thank you. Maybe your important question about um, the relationship between potential tax revenues and realized tax revenues. Well, I think that the good news is that uh, the UNU wider has been working on a project on this. And so there's this new database that tries to look at tax effort across countries. So probably that might be one way, one place to look at in terms of that information. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, Daniel. Andrew, Tanya. Tanya. One minute. <laughs> one minute for you, sorry. Thank you very much for all the suggestion for future research. I think that to, to answer your question, maybe uh, Roberto was right that we probably have to focus on uh, also legal capacity and the determinants of legal capacity and the fact the fact that could um, increase the incentive to invest in legal capacity. So this could be f f there, there is a lot of space for future research and thank you very much. Thank you. One minute. Yes, I, I was going to make the same point in terms of uh, you know improving institutions. There, there are three um, priorities. The first one is capacity, second one is capacity, third one, third one is capacity. So if we can uh, move, move on to that, especially the legal capacity, Roberto said that you know, we have done a lot on fiscal, so we can attack the, the, you know, the legal, it can help. You know, uh, le let me just share also information that you know, in Zambia, for example, they, they have been negotiating this KCM with data deal you know, through the courts, and yesterday they reached the uh, you know, a, a groundbreaking deal where Vindata is coming back to to more or less pump more money into the system, you know, and um, rather, uh, you know, give the government a, a, a better say in the future rather than before. And um, the, this was a result of a protracted negotiations where the Zambian side also put up a strong case. And I think, you know, you know we, we don't know uh, how it will be, but I think it, it looks like it will be a better solution. And this is why we should invest in capacity. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Andrew. And uh, I think we have learned a few things. Heterogeneity matters. The effect of having an extractive industry on uh, public finance is not the same everywhere. It's probably not the same over time. And it's not the same for a... Uh, uh, all types of natural resources. We all know, we've also learned but, uh, that institutions matter. But then we are left with the question, 
how to change that. On the basis of what we have said today, I guess you will agree with me, institutions are part of the structural conditions that make us understand whether public finance resource rich economy succeeds or not. Changing them, it's deeply political. And uh, we don't have the answer that for this uh, yet. Probably other sessions uh, will try to address that or uh, that is left one of the many things left for future research. And now I have to let you go because we have lunch. Thank you to the audience online. Thank you to the audience here. See you later in the next sessions. Thank you.